Um, so, what is your take on this so-called Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act? So, this act, you know, it's just been rushed through the House of Representatives. It really makes a mockery of the very basic principles of of law, both international law and domestic law in the U.S. You know, the basis of the act is that you can make an accusation, you can issue a slander, and you can act on it to impose sanctions, impose boycotts. Without the need to even provide evidence, and in terms of the timing, it's clearly meant to try and embarrass China in advance of the Beijing Winter Olympics, and to step up this U.S.-led propaganda campaign, which aims to demonize China. This is part of an ongoing new Cold War against China that includes multiple components. It includes military measures, you know, the sending U.S. warships to the South China Sea, forming an AUKUS nuclear alliance between the U.S., Britain, and Australia. It includes political diplomatic measures, such as providing support for t- separatists in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and coordinating this so-called diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics. It includes economic measures, the trade war, trying to prevent China's access to semiconductors, sanctions, and so on. And it includes a propaganda war, telling lies about China, painting China as this sort of criminal and authoritarian power, in order to impact. Public opinion against China and to justify the West's increasingly hostile and reckless foreign policy. So I think that's the context of this so-called Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Okay, and as actually this bill would ban all imports from the Chinese region in Xinjiang unless the products are determined to not be con- connected to forced labor. Then. On what basis do you think it is going to decide whether a product is related to forced labor or not? Yeah, well, as I've alluded to, the the idea of innocent until proven guilty is a fundamental principle of the rule of law. But under this act, there's a presumption that actually all goods produced in Xinjiang are made with forced labor. And even though we've got no reliable evidence whatsoever that any goods produced in Xinjiang actually are made with forced labor,、um, that's that's what's in the act. That the, this assumption that All goods are produced with forced labor. You know, we've got these couple of reports from extremely unreliable, deeply anti-China sources, such as the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is strongly linked to the military-industrial complex in the U.S. and Australia, and this single German researcher, Adrian Zenz, who is part of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, that have made these kind of outlandish accusations, and that's it. And, and this act removes any requirement for evidence. So what it means in reality is the imposition of sanctions on all goods made in Xinjiang, and, and part of the rationale for this is clearly to affect people's living standards in Xinjiang and to encourage dissatisfaction, encourage destabilization, encourage separatist elements in the region. Well, Xinjiang accounts for nearly fifty percent of the world's polysilicon, which is a raw material used to manufacture solar panels. And this comes at a time when the U.S. is looking to bolster its own domestic supply chain as it pursues the goal of de- decarbonizing energy. Is this just a coincidence? Clearly, it's not a coincidence. The U.S. wants to be a world leader in green energy, and it wants to prevent China from being the world leader in green energy. But it's such a short-sighted policy on the part of the U.S. You know, Trump tried something very similar with a ban on Chinese solar panels several years ago. Was it successful? Did it create a thriving solar panel industry in the U.S.? It did not. All it meant is that the U.S. transition to a low-carbon economy was interrupted, was slowed down, because they no longer had access to Chinese solar panels, which are both very high quality and low cost. The, you know, the simple fact is that China is. Investment in solar technology over the course of the last, you know, ten to fifteen years, has had the effect of making solar power a cost-effective option around the world, and this is well understood and widely recognised by、uh, environmental NGOs and so on. That because of what China has done, because of its research, its development, its investment, solar power is now competitive with fossil fuels. In almost all parts of the world, this is a, a huge, a phenomenal contribution to the global effort to prevent climate breakdown. The U.S. would be much better advised to collaborate and to coordinate with China on green technology rather than imposing sanctions and boycotts.
Americans.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, what do you make of the Biden administration's recent move to also impose sanctions on the Chinese AI company SenseTime and also blacklisting?、Uh, it is said that it is go- going to also blacklist eight more Chinese companies, including the D- DJI, which is the world's largest commercial drone manufacturer. How do you look at these moves? Well, it's all part of a wider technology war, which is itself part of the overall new Cold War. The U.S. was extremely happy with China when it was a center for low-cost manufacturing, forty years ago, thirty years ago, when it was essentially at the bottom of the global value chain. The U.S. didn't expect that China would invest heavily in research and development, invest in science, invest in technology, in human resources. Yeah. In you know, in a nutshell, it didn't expect that China would pursue this very, very effective economic strategy, that it would rise up the value chain, and that it would become a world leader in several areas of science and technology, including 5G, including AI, including nanotechnology, including renewable energy, and so on. So, this situation that we're now in is clearly unacceptable to the U.S. And it's now trying to slow down China's rise by imposing sanctions and by blacklisting companies. For example, you know, trying to get Huawei removed from network infrastructure in various countries and so on. These moves are, are predictable, but they're frankly somewhat pathetic, and they're not going to be successful in stopping China's rise.、Um, then, how do you think China should respond to this technology war, or what do you say, the new Cold War? Well,、uh, you know, China. Obviously, for the sake of its dignity and and for the sake of just defending its sovereignty, has to respond to unilateral attacks of this nature. It may well impose reciprocal sanctions on on various U.S. companies, and actually, these sanctions will be much more effective than U.S. sanctions on Chinese companies. China has a huge domestic market. It has excellent trading relations with the world. It's the largest trading partner of the majority of the world's countries. It can sell certain goods. If it, you know, if it can't sell certain goods to the U.S., it can certainly sell them in Asia, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and so on. So once again, the U.S. strategy isn't just reckless, but it's self-defeating.、Uh, but do you see the risk of、uh, U.S.-China decoupling, and what be, what would be the consequences of a decoupling? I think, in political and strategic terms. Decoupling is a dangerous concept because we're at a stage where the world desperately needs more cooperation, more friendship, more mutual understanding. We've got multiple problems, global problems that can only be solved at a global level: climate change, pandemics, the establishment of a stable peace, tackling poverty, meeting the、uh, Millennium Goals of the UN, and so on. These are these are. Global challenges that we have to face together, and decoupling means creating an environment which makes that cooperation very difficult. Economically, the main impact would be on the U.S., not on China. As I've said, China's got its own huge domestic market. It's got very good relations with nearly all the countries in the world. It would, ultimately, decoupling for the U.S. means the U.S. losing access to Chinese investment and to a Chinese market of 1.4 billion people. Okay, thank you, Carlos Martinez, London-based author and activist.